Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. This is Dr. David Proden. And I want to thank you as we begin another journey into school and community safety. If you're looking for industrial safety expert, Appalachian State University professor, Dr. Timothy Ludwig, please visit www.safety-doc.com. Again, that's Dr. Timothy Ludwig at www.safety-doc.com. So we're biking down the street at a pretty good pace. And suddenly, um, Robert puts his feet down. And I'm at the front. He's at the back, tandem bike. Um, I'm like, Robert, what's up? What's up? And I'm trying to keep the bike upright. I work it over to the side. And uh, I said, why'd you put your feet down? And he... He didn't respond. I said, are you okay? Um, any any problem out here? Is it too hot, too cold? Uh, but nope, he was okay. He was okay. For some reason, the feet just went off the pedals. We had, we've done this tandem biking many times before. Um, I'm an experienced biker, so I was able to keep the bike upright. And, and, uh, but just the strangest thing. And, uh, but Robert, Robert has autism. And uh, he's a high school student. So it's fascinating when I'm able to go out on rides with him. So I go out and there are other people that go out together on these bike rides and and use these tandem bikes, which are awesome. Absolutely awesome. Um, And we go through areas which have gradual sloping, you know, you go down and you describe what's happening and going up and, um, but recently it's been a little bit different. So use these as an opportunity to foster communication and discussion because in addition to having autism, Robert is also blind. So we drive or we bike by um, and we hear the sound of, of, of a roof being put on, okay? Because there was this hailstorm that went through and probably like a third of the town was hit by this where, you know, required new roof, new siding. You could see the holes pecked in the siding, the vinyl siding, especially the white siding was most prominent. And then every house, it seemed, had the sign in the yard, roofing by whatever or home improvement by whatever. But what you heard, what you heard was the sound of the nail guns, the sound of shingles being dragged across the roof, the sound of compressors and trying to describe this to Robert of what's happening around him, that there was this hailstorm. Everything's fine now. Everything's fine. And the roofs of these homes and the sides were all damaged during these storms. And the, the hail came out of the sky, which is similar to, I guess, ice cubes in a way and, and damaged these. And now they're being replaced. Um, so it's an abstract concept. Think about it. It, It's a hard concept to describe to someone, one who doesn't really understand what a storm is. Um, and I asked Robert, what is a storm? And, and, you know, because he can, he can associate things that go with the storm, wind, rain, but as far as, you know, like the damage that can be done to a storm and some of those more abstract things, Um, he's not able to do that, but he's able to do a ton of things. You know, he's able to do a lot, but so we're, we're biking and I'm saying, okay, listen up ahead on the left. Um, they're going to be working on a couple homes. So we'd go by, what do we hear? We hear the air compressor. Um, okay. Right now, what are they doing? They're putting down the shingles. It's actually, you know, bringing a shingle. I've got extra ones. Here's what, here's what a shingle feels like goes on top. It's on top of a lot of houses, not all of them. Um, But wow, 
while biking. And you know what? Ro- Robert's Robert's a strong kid, so we also work on cadence. And I'll be like, okay, we're going to push down left, right, left, right. And I can figure out when our cadence is correct because I can feel his pushing down on the pedals. Because otherwise, it could be a lot of work for me to... Um, get the bike going, especially up hills, because we keep the tires a little um, under inflated, kind of help with the maneuverability of the the bikes and and traction. Um, But it it can be a lot, especially, you know, when you have a high school size student on the back. (laughs) So we're going through and and we're hearing this. And pretty soon William's like um, saying compressor and, and they're pulling the shingles and they're putting down the shingles. And it's just amazing. But, you know, what I wanted to talk about today was something I thought about during that bike ride. And it is, what's the rubric for good? What is the rubric for good? We, How can you look at something and just say, yeah, that's good. That is good what is happening right there or that image or that whatever, that's good, okay? And not get it where you have to run all of these filters of judgment and everything, um, but that it's that is good. And I thought about as we would bike past people and they would recognize that Robert was blind and the other students were, were blind Um, because obviously School for the Blind is very close to this area, so they could kind of recognize when the students are out. Um, But how do you, you know, I'm I'm trying to put myself, if I had no awareness of of Robert and, and other students and these students are biking by, I'd look at that and I'd be like, that's good. That is, that is just a good thing. That's just good. There's goodness in that. And I wouldn't be able necessarily to identify the litany of reasons why that is good. It's just good. At face value, that's good. That's good. Um, and I'm thinking, how do we know, though, wh- what is this rubric that we automatically have that fills in, you know, kind of like the bingo card of ding, 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 four points here, four points here, four points here, four points here. Okay. It all adds up and we've hit our score and this is good because it's like we need to have things explained to us. Like this is good. This is bad. And, um, and you know, what's in between and all that. But I would say you could take even a snapshot of, us on the bikes and show it to people and just say, is this good or bad? And most people are all going to say, it's good. This is really good. This is good. This is, this is a good thing that's going on here. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but this is a good thing. I mean, what's your reaction? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And for me, out of everything that I have done in life that I can recall. Okay, so, but I know in that moment that that is good, that that is good. And I know when I think about it later on, I know when I get to the point where all of the work stuff is done, which hopefully isn't too far down the road. I was kind of doing my retirement calculation, like, hey, it's looking pretty good. But I know I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to look back at life, which actually, you know, we all do. And I've, I, I, I have done more of that recently. I think looking back as I look to the future, because again, I am approaching um, some decisions on retirement, not retiring right now. Won't be long though. It's getting pretty close. Um, so you kind of look back as you look ahead, if that makes any sense. But as I look back, what are some of the most significant things that I've done in life? Um, And then also, what are those things that have just fallen into that good side, just been there? 
Um, not necessarily like that I've had to make them into good. They've just been good. Like, um, you know, being on a bike. When I tell the story years from now of, you know what? I, I would bike with, um, with a boy who had autism and was blind. And he completely trusted me. And he was, he, he's, he was a fun kid. So imagine like 20 years I'm telling this story. And, you know, at that point he's approaching 40 and whatever. But um, I'm just telling the story to other people and, you know, let's say 20 years from now. So you know what? I, I was biking. And it, just a, a perfect day. Sun was out, 75 degrees, and, and had all of this construction going on. All of these things, so I was able to tell Robert what was going on. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that was something good. Like, I remember that, and I, I just remember um, Robert was like having your own radio station from back in, oh, what was it, the 70s and 80s, the cars they had where you, you would push, there were like six teeth type buttons. And he would push them to change radio stations. But really, they didn't exactly change. They just kind of got you closer to a different station. <laughs> and um, it was kind of like that because Robert knew every song, knows every song. So I kind of like would say, let's hear a little bit of whatever. Bing, 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 bing. He's there. He's singing it. He's right on. Okay, we've had enough of that. Let's do some Bon Jovi. So it's like the only tandem bike that also had... Um, an on-demand stereo with it. Um, so we could we could do that. It was just kind of a fun thing with Robert. Um, but also that trust. I'll tell you one thing. When a student who is blind, and maybe this is anybody who's blind, but when a student who is blind is w- willing to give you their cane and then you guide them like to the bike. Imagine getting on a bike and... And, you know, you're totally dependent upon the, who's whoever is steering the bike and, and making those decisions. Um, so, you, so you put that vesting in and, and you're there. And, of course, you know, I've known Robert for a number of years now, so I have that with him. But even still to this day, I know how hard it is if, for students who are blind. I mean, once you, you give up that cane, that is that security that's being able to find your way around. It's also defense. There's so many things that are become ingrained in that cane. So when you hand that cane over, um, I think it's it's this display of trust, which is unmeasured, unmeasured. Um, but like I said, I I will look back, and there will be a handful of things, and and a number of those will include you know things with my family and whatever. But this will be a moment that I will always say. I'm glad I had the opportunity to be a part of, and it was good. And nobody needed to tell me it was good, and there didn't need to be any filters on how, what um, degree of goodness this was to do this this bike outing. It was just good. So. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. My daughter. <laughs> you know, um, it reminded me a little bit of, of 
maybe the 1950s, you know, reading back to the 50s. And I, I used to go through the Time magazines. I used to love those, you know, from the 1950s and, and just paging through. Just love those. Um, my daughter, though, second second grade, my youngest daughter. So it was, and so this was a while ago, but I had forgot to, to share it. And I want to share it because I think it's really a moving story. And again, I think if we talk about something that's, that is just innately good, but, um, it was the night I was going to take her to, um, so she could pick out things for mom for mother's day or she had one, one item she wanted to pick out for mom for mother's day. So I was given the directions to go to, um, where dad, you're taking me to Walmart and, and, um, she comes out of her room and she has changed into on her own, changed into like a, a dress that you'd wear to church, very formal. And she has her purse, her matching purse, and she has her money and she knows exactly what she wants. And she wants daisies. And she had been there uh, when we did our regular shopping. Uh, my wife had pointed out some daisies in the front, and they were in a in an orange container, uh, front of the store. And uh, she had just mentioned those. And so my daughter was insistent was insisting that we get these daisies. So we drive, and it's not very far from where we live. Um, she goes right up looks at the different daisies and I'm kind of making sure in the background and the dad thing of, um, you know, that we don't get daisies that are all like blossomed out right now because it was still a little ways to mother's day, a couple days. So some that were just starting to blossom. So when she would give them, they would be, you know, all, all blossomed out at that time. And, um, she picked out the exact pot that I would have picked out, <laughs> And she took it and we went in the store and I was, you know, basically the, the driver at that point. <laughs> and she walked around to the checkout, put it on the checkout, um, had a, you know, very nice greeting with the, the checkout person. And then she, um, opened up her purse and went through her money and got out the, uh, you know, approximate amount and put it down, paid for it. And then, um, I carried it out. It didn't make any sense to put it in a bag and whatever. I carried it out. And then we did have a secured way to put it in the, in the car. Um, and we got it, we got it home. Um, and I did, you know, I had, took a picture of, of it when she gave it to my wife. Um, but, it was again something special to dress formal and to be to to do this to take these steps um very i wouldn't say adult like because like i a lot of adults don't do things like that um but you know you look at pictures of like people going to just baseball games back in the 1930s and 40s and everybody was dressed up you know everybody was was dressed up it was more like that era that she did that and just this mature thing but i think to to again take the snapshot in my mind of of her looking over these daisies and then picking out but then this whole image of having the purse and the formal dress and 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 just um, again, there, there was goodness in that. There was goodness in, in that moment. So again, one of these moments, and maybe I get a more cognizant of these things that now that I'm older, for, the, for those of you, by the way, who are watching this on YouTube, uh, I do my hair completely, um, comb back today in the Egon Spengler Ghostbusters look. So I have a haircut coming up, but it's gotten a little bit long. So this is the easiest way to manage it. It's kind of fun because it makes me like an inch taller than I am. <laughs> so instead of six foot, I go to like six one with this. So maybe I need to work this more often. And actually, it's not a bad look. Um, but 
I, uh, in summer, I like to keep it a little shorter than where it's at right now. But so, yes, I have my Egon Spengler, my Spengler look going on today. It's pretty cool with a visor if you do that pair of visor with it. So, but these things you recognize, recognize is good. And I don't think you need to, you don't have to have people explain it to you. And I think other people would recognize it as good also. And I think it holds to the test of time that it's good. I don't think it's context dependent. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it's context dependent. But again, maybe it's just I'm getting older and I'm being more aware of these types of things. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I just would have glossed over it when I was younger. I might have. Um, I might have. But not now. Definitely not now. So um, it was back about, oh, 12 years ago or so. Uh, I was a, a tour guide. Tour guide. Hey, everybody. I'm David. I will be your tour guide today here at Fort Winnebago in Portage, Wisconsin. The fort, um, approximately 18 18 for some of the first buildings um, to be erected. And one of the remaining buildings here is from 1824. This could also be the start date, but we know for sure 1824. Uh, this is the surgeon's quarters. Originally, though, this was built years prior. And it was used as more of a trading port. I think they used it actually as a building. Um, so the, the Fox River is there and, it, and the Wisconsin, very close by. So portage literally means portage. Like you could drag your canoe or whatever boat, I guess, you know, back in the 16, 17, 1800s across about a mile of land between the Wisconsin and Fox. And from the Fox, you could get out to the Atlantic and the Wisconsin would get you to the Mississippi. So you could cover quite a bit of range. But anyway, I was, I was a tour guide. I, I volunteered because I took a tour. And I've always liked history. And I was like, this, this is awesome. So what, what happened was, um, I believe it was in 1828, um, in 1828, there was a formal military fort, it was Fort Winnebago, that was built on this site at the edge of my town. So from where I live, I live on the Indian Hills subdivision, literally meaning I live where the Winnebago encampments were 200 years ago. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, yeah, so the fort, but the first building that went up on that area, I think was around 1818. And it was, it was this building that got turned into a surgeon's quarters, which then, um, later it, it became restored by the daughters of the American revolution is the only building left from the fort. But anyway, so I'm a tour guide, I'm a tour guide. Yeah. So I learned to be a tour guide. I get the script. I'm going through it, did my own research. And, um, I, I did it for a couple of years, and then just didn't do it anymore. You know, once, once you have a family and stuff like that, then other things, but I enjoyed doing it and it was mostly, you know, it was just weekends. It was a couple hours on, you know, like a Saturday or a Sunday or something like that. And there were never like a lot of people, but people would come by. And so I'd give them the tour. Um, but I also, so, so I, let me get back to the billing. So the, the billing was there and then you could go up and hire someone to help you move your things from like across the Fox to the Wisconsin or Wisconsin to Fox. So that's how it was originally put together. And there was, there's a basement. It's not very big, but so you can go down and it's probably like four or five feet high. And I think you could also pay to have things stored there. I'm not so sure on that. I haven't done the tour for years, but, um, but this building was fascinating to me. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, so there was actually a footprint from somebody pushing down to, to do um, a, a wheel 
spinning yarn, a footprint that was was pushed into the floor. So, you know, it had been painted, sealed over many times, but this footprint was still, this indent was still there of this foot. Imagine that. So the fort, next to the fort, there was a hospital. And many, many people died. Indians and soldiers died, you know, from the f- flu and, and, and just other, you know, conditions. Plus, I mean, he didn't live that long. Come on, I mean, he's back. What was it? You know, the fort was built in 1828. I think it was in existence till about 1845 and then disbanded it. So actually, so where I live, folks, like the, I think is the the second or third oldest community in Wisconsin. So um, there used to be a time when people would, would like, hey, I'm putting an addition on my garage. And then they would find, you know, some bodies they'd dig up because people were buried there and nothing was ever marked. But, you know, um, it's kind of just... An, an old town. That's that's what you get. But um, so I was this tour guide at Fort Winnebago, and it had kind of fallen into disrepair at that time. So I also used my skills to work on some upkeep of the facility. So like work on the shutters, and I did all this volunteer. Um, but you know stuff like that. Some of the landscaping, and my dad and I kind of put together this project where we would work two full days on rebuilding one, um, a split rail fence. Okay. That had been rebuilt at some point. I mean, this wasn't an 1824 split rail fence, but, um, was, had been rebuilt in the original fashion of a fence that was there before, which was probably there before, whatever. So this fence was about Oh, maybe a hundred feet long, the split rail fence. And then there was also a well in front of the surgeon's quarters. And that was cosmetic, but that had also fallen into disrepair. At some point there was a well, but it wouldn't have been like right there. It would have been probably somewhere else. But, you know, for the whole display, that's that's where this well had been probably built, maybe around the 1950s, but it had fallen into disrepair. So we put together this project of we're going to to basically work on the grounds for two days, rebuild the well, the um, and also the split rail fence. So we took these and make it authentic, as authentic as possible. So um, I had a lot of my tools and. My dad got um, fence posts and weathered fence posts that had been, you know, used for ginseng farming, actually. Brought them down on a trailer and we hand cut these to length and notched them. And I used lag bolts, huge lag bolts, because I needed this thing. I, I, I I didn't know how to do the Jenga puzzle of trying to get this thing together on its own. And I didn't have time to, you know, drill through with hand, you know, hand drills and make little pegs and try to hold this thing together like that way. Like there was, there was some sacrifices that had to be made for authenticity, um, but, um, or to authenticity. But anyway, I did this and um, with, with my dad. So all of these leg bolts to hold this together. And then, you know, you kind of put the one piece over the leg bolts and, you know, disguise everything. And it looked great. You know, super solid. But and we drilled down or not drill down. We had manual post hole diggers. So as we're taking this thing apart and then like building it, you know, out at 10 feet and then take down another 10 feet and then build that 10 feet. Um, it turned out remarkably well. I mean, it looked super authentic. It was solid. And a lot of this had kind of fallen down and just gone into disrepair, like I had said. So that was really cool. And then we got to the well and were able to rebuild the well. And I have a picture of that. So if you're watching the YouTube version, you get to see that. But um, we rebuilt the well, and that turned out really well, too. And it was very strong. To this day, it's still... um, that same, that same frame that, you know, so that, that turned out really well, the well turned out well. Um, and then of course, trimming up all of the trees and, and just mowing and, 
just trailers full trailer loads full of leaves and that hadn't been raked you know they would just fall and kind of decay and then the next year more leaves would fall and um it you know it was one of these places that just didn't really have much of a budget and it wasn't run by the city it was run again by the daughters of the american revolution so there were limitations on what could be done and any resources really went into the building because just to keep the foundation the one wall was kind of leaning outward and they had to do some um, work on that and, and things. So any money that would come in would have to go into things like that. So, but we spent two full days and when we got done, one, it was a really great thing to do with my dad. So I appreciate that. That was really a terrific chance to have time with him to build. When you build something, you know, it's tangible and, and there's just something so much to that. But um, yeah, there, we, we did this, we get, we, we built this, this, this was incredible. I mean, it just was great. And I remember again, if I'm looking at this whole kind of complex, when we're done, there was a feeling of good with that. And I think you could take people and they could, they could view this again, or you could just take people there and what would be your feeling. And I'm, I'm this feeling of good. Um, and I want to, I want to put this down that, um, this was before the age of likes and votes and all of that. Like there wasn't anything in this for me, awards or payment or stuff like that, other than I wanted to give this to the community, but I also wanted to preserve this. Like, um, I love history and, and historian, and I knew I had the ability to do this to make these contributions. Um, and it was one of those things that the newspaper never came out. I mean, we didn't call the newspaper, or the people, you know, that were in charge. Um, and there weren't any stories written about this. And that's good because like that, I think would have taken away from it. You know, um, this was just kind of meant to happen. And then the people who would be there, we did this before opening day that year. Um, so, that was really cool because for, for opening day, they had, you know, like the mayor there and some other dignitaries. And, um, but to, this place just looked awesome. But I remember just how much sweat equity went into that. But I also felt this connection and appreciation for the soldiers who had served at the fort. And, you know, it feels a little strange, but it's almost like there was a little bit of a feeling of a appreciation coming back from 1828 to 1845 to, to the time that we were doing that, of just saying thank you for keeping this place around and for caring for it. I know that sounds a little out there, but there was this, this palpable sense that I felt, um, especially you know once we got it moved along and, and close to being finished of just you know, that we had secured things, things that needed attention, um, and put a lot of work into it. And just that, again, it was, it, it went from looking disrepair and decay to looking in that original state of, you know, how it had looked probably back in the 1840s. So it was, it was just really cool, really cool. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. going to switch gears and t- 
talk about my my microphone setup. <laughs> wow, that is switching gears. So yeah, no, I'm ordering a um, a head mic, so it'll have the mouth, well, the piece coming out, and um, so you know, basically a headset is what I'm ordering. Okay, a headset. But the reason I'm ordering a headset is I I do a fair amount of communications which are not podcasts, obviously, or I'm not participating in podcasts. And for those, I just need to be able to talk to people. So to set up the microphone, um, you know, it does a great job for recording better audio for like the podcast, but it's not anything I really need for a lot of the work that I do. I'm going to talk about an article right now. And it is the real meaning of good and evil. (gasps) Whoa. Okay. August 23rd, 2013. Um, This came out of Psychology Today. And the subtitle is How Are Saintly People Different from Evil Ones? What Does Good Really Mean? And so I'm kind of lukewarm on this article because it's the real meaning of good and the real meaning of evil. And we've just talked before about what is a rubric for good, meaning like what are some things that are just good? And, you know, there are, on my way out of town, there's something, there's a marker, historical marker, and I think it's called like John Muir View, something like that, John Muir who, you know, the, is known for preserving, um, you know, natural vistas and, and his contributions to nature. But um, there are certain things, you know, John Muir could look at and, and say, that's good. Like there's beauty in, in that. There's inherent good in the stream. It's just, it's good. And it's kind of like when I listen to the T.J. Martinell podcast, which is now the Mountain Pass podcast. Check that out, Mountain Pass podcast. But T.J. talks about hiking, and he brings you along with him the way he describes these back roads um, that the Forest Service doesn't really keep up. So you're you're kind of going through things that are overgrown and can get muddy, and you can have some kind of um, interesting hills to navigate, especially when they're, they're a little bit wet. Um, but he, he brings you along and to these, these vistas, which are just, they're good. They're good. Nobody needs to tell you they're good. They're good. You know that they're good. And again, John Muir knew that they're good. I'm sure people standing in front of Niagara Falls, um, you know, some of the first settlers or whatever knew that was good. So just what is good? What is good? So let me go through this article because there's some things in here which are kind of strange. See, this is where this is where we get into positionality. This is where we get into we feel that, hey, this is good. This is not good. Here's like, you know, whatever, like we interpret things and then we, we tell people what they, sh- how they should interpret things also. Um, and I've talked about that in some previous shows, this whole thing of positionality, meaning um, it's, it's one thing for an authentic experience and it's one thing for an experience which has been put together by somebody else. And it's like... Um, Kind of like when we took a, you know, took a trip to, well, when we took a trip to Disney, I mean, the person that helped us plan the trip, and that was very helpful, um, had been there many times. So, of course, had favorite things um, that they had done, but was very careful into saying just because, like, this was something that our family enjoyed doing or whatever, like, doesn't mean your family's going to enjoy doing it. So here are some of the, the, um, details. All you want to know is like, 
here's some times when this will be less busy. Here's some extra ways to, or some ways to get extra fast passes and, and some of those things. And, um, you know, just in general, when you're traveling, if you can kind of group things together. So like whatever, whatever. So those were all helpful, but left a lot of open space. And then did, I did say like, what are, if you had like two or three things you definitely would put on your list of like, here's things people really should partake in if they go to Disney World, what would they be? And she said, here's what those things are. And she was spot on. Um, and if they wouldn't have turned out to be like things, I'd be like, oh, like I had a friend once who recommended this um, place to stay up north because it was real like rugged. <laughs> and uh, and we stayed at this, like he loved going there with his family and uh and just like to him this was this was you know better than sliced bread so we booked it and we hated it (laughs) it was way too rugged for us and i remember um my daughter looking at the bottom of her socks after she walked across the floor and in her in this place we stayed and they were like brown because it was rugged i mean it, it wasn't meant to have kind of the modern conveniences and stuff like that. And we're more into that. Not that we're like super high scale, but like definitely, you know, Holiday Inn Express or something like that. Um, and now when we go, we do, um, you know, vacation, you know, if it is something that's going to be more cabin or something like that, we'll go, you know, again with more amenities because we don't do a lot of that. But it was funny because his view, and he he was convinced that we would have the same experience that he and his family had, but no. <laughs> I remember like it just after an hour there, I'm like, what what was he thinking? Like this wasn't a prank because he wouldn't do this to me like we wouldn't. And so I just kind of got a kick out of that. So let's talk about good though. What is good? So per this article, good means a lack of self-centeredness. It means the ability to empathize with other people, to feel compassion for them, and to put their needs before your own. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Good means a lack of self-centeredness. It means the ability to empathize with other people, to feel compassion for them, and to put their needs before your own. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I believe good exists independent of that. Because right now we're we're assigning what a human is assigning as good, so you have to put compassion into this and empathy, and and it's 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 not self centeredness. But I'm like you know, um, again like Niagara Falls or um, you know my my bike ride with Robert. I mean these types of things. You, you don't have to inject this empathy, self-centeredness, putting compassion in there, needs before your own. Some things are just good, okay? So this is, this is very important, I think, for psychological health. I think this is very important when we get to the part of the safety doc that focuses on agency and purpose, which we've done a lot on. And I, I could certainly get into... Um, you know, the school shootings and violence and things like that. And, um, and I am going to have on, um, Will Cloud, who is producing, um, the movie, just another school shooting. I'm serving as a consulting producer to that. And, uh, Will's going to talk about his motivation, um, to film that he's got quite a crew, um, put together for that including James Russell, who worked on Star Wars. Um, So we're going to get into that. And also had a former uh, co-worker who lost her son and his wife uh, due to drug reactions. Um, And so, I mean, there are things that, that I want to get into in this show they're going to focus back into those things, which are more, um, more mechanical, I think, parts of the safety doc show. But right now, I, I, I just feel a need to talk about agency and, and purpose. And because I, 
I think we have so much of this prescribed to us through social media, but just not through social media, through advertising. But we're not, we're not exploring. We're not doing reconnaissance. We're we're being told what to do, and maybe this is just because of, you know, we've fallen into this pattern in life. Um, and I think another thing is, um, it is it is very scary right now, as I shared in my discussion in the previous podcast with Ann, author Ann Sturzinger. Um, it's you know, it's hard to understand or project how people will interpret what you do and what you say. So, you know, this whole thing of what is good, what is bad can, can easily butt up and, and be mashed, you know, kind of like that putty or not putty. What is it? The slime, it can be all mashed together with like, what is a microaggression and, you know, that you're making a hostile work environment and stuff like that. So it's hard to figure out these empirical things of just like, what is, what is good? What is a rubric for good? What is a rubric for good? And just recognizing like, what is good? Because I think if we can do that at face value, it, it helps with our psychological, our our sense of self. And we know that when we have sense of self, you know, we have agency and we have purpose and sense of control over ourselves and our environments that, um, you know, we're just happier as humans and more productive. Um, And these things are super important as we approach an age of rapid automation, things um you know, robotics, people losing jobs, um, the, you know, singularity coming. And, you know, all of these questions of in a hundred years, what jobs really will be left um, as the world changes around us from more nature-based to more maybe technology and manufactured-based, maybe. Um, what is What is good then? Um, I don't, I don't know. And we have to, we have to understand that we have to understand that because if we, if we don't, we have this, this void, this loss of meaning, this loss of control. And then again, we're told this is good. This is bad. This is how you should feel. This is what your position should be. So let me go on with this article. Okay. Okay. It means benevolence, altruism, and selflessness and self-sacrifice towards a greater cause, all qualities which stem from a sense of empathy. So this is what good is. Good is. It means benevolence, altruism, and selflessness and self-sacrifice toward a greater cause, all qualities which stem from a sense of empathy. Again, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. That is saying good has to be driven by what a human creates as good. Okay? Not that good can just exist. Not that good can just exist. I, you know, th- I love biking and I'm planning on biking tomorrow. I actually just charged up all of my various lights on my bike. They all USB charged now, which is great. Absolutely love that. Um, but there's there's a garden I'll pass tomorrow, probably because it's usually every year this guy um, does a small garden, maybe about two acres, and plants different things. It's really cool, and and it's just so meticulous. And and he he has some rusting old, um, you know, it used to be horse pulled. Um, plows kind of as, as a backdrop and things like this. So, but going past that and then you kind of go up a hill, but just like that, like that garden is good. Like that's good. That scene, that being there, that's good. So again, this article is pushing this whole thing of like how we 
must interact with others and and the things that we must do to you know this this, this is the self-imposed positionality rubric of saying you must do these things to create good to be a good person basically if, if you reverse this this is saying if you don't do these things you're not a good person um or maybe not this, not that you're a bad person necessarily but you're you're not you, you haven't met the good person checklist you haven't done that and i'm like that's garbage I, I, I things can be good without having this human filter and when you do this right now this is you're taking the positionality of this author um and granted is there anything wrong with benevolence, altruism, selflessness, self-sacrifice toward a greater cause? Which I don't know that what the hell exactly is a greater cause. I think you can argue that, you know, forever. What is a greater cause? Well, what is, is there a greater cause than one's own, I guess, happiness, sense of agency and purpose? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you look internal. I think if, if, See, it's this whole thing where we fo- we focus so much on having to contribute to making others better. And we don't then, and the thought is, well, by doing that, you make yourself better. I don't, I don't know. All right. Also, it says, goodness in human beings emerges when we are connected. Maybe, but maybe not. We think about John Muir, again, going across the country and, and, documenting all of these beautiful vistas, these landscapes he saw, um, being connected, but isn't, so goodness in human beings emerges and we are connected. At times, yes. At times, no. You know, at times being connected can create consensus and can create groupthink. Um, that was one thing in my dissertation I found that when you had small groups, like very small groups, you could usually get pretty good decisions out of small groups. But when you got to a very large group, it was more or less just a consensus. It was a majority and people would default into the majority. Um, so again, we, we talk about this, this connectedness, um, you know, if, if there's a disaster, and you walk out of your house and everybody's running in one direction, most people are going to start running in that direction. Even though they don't know why, they don't know the first person that started to run in that direction and then the other person that followed. And if it really makes sense to do that, they're just doing that. So this whole thing that we have to be connected, I actually think like being not connected is a good thing. (laughs) Being connected at times is okay. But, you know, how many of us are checking our phones, I mean, countless times per day and social media accounts and TV and all of these types of things? Um, But you know what? Life life is fine and goes on without being connected. Um, And... Boy, I, I just think that's, a, again, that's a statement that pushes positionality, pushes somebody else's agenda onto you when you read an article like that. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, these are things I should really do or these these are ways I should really live my life. And it's like, no, no, I don't think so. I think you have to critically evaluate all of these things, which is good. Good to do that, right? Critical evaluation. But you are in control of you and you look out for the loved ones around you also, but ultimately you are in control of you. Um, so this whole prescription, and that's why these self-help books, you know, fly off the shelves and all of these things, diet books and happiness and, you know, whatever. But the reality is, again, you know, do those really work? Not really. Really, I mean, people will reach out for an easy way. They'll try to take somebody else's path that might have got there. Maybe they sustained it. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But 
Um, I just think again and again and again and again, the positionality, the positionality, understanding when you are being told something versus like what identify what I talked about earlier with with Robert and with my my daughter and, and the flowers and those types of things versus like this person saying like goodness in human beings emerges when we are connected and gives all of these types of things. No. Afraid not, I'm not going there with you. I'm not making that I'm not making that trip. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. So it also talks a lot about the uh, fluidity. It's a word used throughout this of goodness. And th- it seems very contextual. Like that can be good. Things can be good now, can be considered good or innately good, but like in a different context, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, 100 years ago, it wasn't good, whatever. And in, again, I think goodness is goodness. And it's independent of time and context. So, um, and it is independent of um, this this whole fluidity thing. So, I don't I don't know, I don't know, folks. But the more I work in safety. I find that the first place to start with anybody with safety is just their own um, agency and purpose and that they really ground, get that grounded. And then they, once they have that and can identify that, um, and it's amazing how many people will admit that they've been more or less a kite, you know, the winds of, of, of the positionality of others political parties or left or right or whatever, um, how much that's controlled them. And you hit the wrong wind, you can go and crash that kite and smash it. Um, so you, it's, a, it's, again, amazing to me because these are, these are people who are, you know, my age or younger or older. Um, and once you've been moved to that position or, or to, to that place where positionality and you've been so controlled and, and, and just have been told what to do, told what is good. I don't know. It's not, it's not good. It's not good. Cause you'll always be looking for that. I, I was, I was watching this documentary that how they built, um, the, um, the Met, um, or the Metropolitan was it the, the Lincoln, music house in New York. I think it was back in the early sixties and the architect got some people up on stage and, and they, they started to sing before the billing was completed. And he said, once I could hear their, the voices come off the different, angles of the way that I had designed the building, and everything. I, I knew that we had good acoustics. I knew, I knew we had good acoustics. Now he didn't have machinery. They weren't measuring everything from every angle and whatever, whatever. But he said, I knew the building had good ac- acoustics. I knew it. And it did. Um, you know, that was later confirmed through, you know, these machines, which are again, have positionality because they're created to measure certain things and there could be machines created to measure other things. But um, there's something again that can just be identified as that's good. That's good. We're good. So thank you so much uh, for listening to the safety doc podcast. Please check out my previous podcast. This is number 70. So we have a number of uh, podcasts out there. And I think there's a a lot for everyone. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Remember to check back each week for the latest 
Best and Most Bizarre Practices in Safety Preparation and Crisis Response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.